now all right. So we are taking a break from our series in Luke. Uh, we have been going through Luke verse by verse for a while now, and so we're going to take a break for a couple of weeks. Uh, we want to uh, kind of recognize all that, that God is doing uh, in our families and kind of quite honestly, a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago, we just recognized there just seems to be an attack on our families, not only here at Live Oak Church, but in the community. I began to get phone call or a message almost daily about a, a specific attack on the families, a specific attack on teenagers or children or, or marriages or what, uh, you know, whatever. And so I was like, you know what, let's take a break. Let's take a pause from Luke for a couple of weeks and let's just examine the families. And, and so the title of the series is Healing Families. And we're just going to take three weeks and look at a couple of different things that we can do to heal our families. And so today the title of the, the message is Healing Words. Because I believe that we have got to uh, kind of learn how to, uh, to, to speak better. We need to communicate better. Proverbs 10, 11 says, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. And so I, I believe that words are, are important. I believe that communication is important. Whenever I do premarital counseling, I always devote one session to doing nothing but teaching the couple how to communicate. I always tell them, I was like, guys, today I'm going to teach you how to fight. And I always get this, like, this look like, what? You know, it's like, and the guy's always like, yeah, we got that. You know, but it's like, no, no, no. I want to teach you how to disagree. I want to teach you how to communicate in a productive way. And, and so this is kind of going to be kind of the, the primer for the rest of the series, but I think it's very important because quite frankly, we've all heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's one of the biggest lies ever told in history because in my life, I have gotten in fights. In my life, I've been hit. In my life, I've been kicked. In my life, I've been bitten. I don't remember those particular situations. I don't feel that pain anymore, but I do still feel the pain of childhood trauma when someone speaks something ill of me. I still feel when someone lies, when someone hurts me by what they say. To this day, it could be 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, to this day, I still feel the pain. And so words do uh, do, do mean a lot. And so we're going to jump into about two scripture verses here, passages here today. Your first, the first passage I want us to look at is in Matthew chapter 12. We'll be in verses 33 through 37. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. Two things I want us to kind of glean from this passage is, number one, that our words reveal. Our words reveal. In verse 33 says, either... Make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil." I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day, and I just pray, God, as we study your word, that we will be obedient to the context, that we will be obedient to the true teaching of your word, that we will be transformed to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So out of this passage, just a few short verses, but out of this passage is some really important things. And number one is just the idea that our words reveal. What you say reveals about what's inside you. What is in your spirit will re be revealed in your words. What is in your spirit will be revealed in your words. What is it, what, if you are, are bitter in your heart, if you're angry in your heart, you're going to be angry in your words. I mean, it's just, it's so so prevalent, you know, uh, angry people speak angry words. It's it, it just, you know, it's just a, a habit that way. I, I was thinking about this earlier and this why it's so important that you're in a life group or that you're in an accountability group. It's important that you're with someone who can recognize your words. 
It's important to be around someone who recognizes when you're a little bit more critical than normal, when you're a little bit more biting than normal. You know, when, when all of a sudden it just seems like everything you say has criticism, you know, it's like, oh, I can't stand this, oh, I can't stand that. And you're just bitter, and you're just, it seems like everything is coming out critical or angry. To have someone say, listen, I'm concerned. Because if, if your speech, if you're constantly critical with your words, that is in, indicative of a critical spirit. But if you find that person that just seems to be uplifting and, and find that person that just seems to find the, the, the good and the positive and, and how God is at work and they speak good things even in the midst of trials, you know that their heart is in a good place. Now, I'm not talking about the bubbly, happy person. That person's annoying, and we all can't stand that person. That's different. I mean, it's like, hi, this is wonderful. No, 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 I'm not talking about that guy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the person that can, you know, it's like, man, this is tough. But I believe that God's in this. I believe that God can handle this. You know, I, you, know you, you can see, okay, out of that heart, you know that they're speaking, you know, out of their speech, you see that the, the, the heart is there. I, I believe with all my heart. When you look at the scripture, it says the good, uh, uh, I tell you, on the day of judgment, anytime you read that on the day of judgment, you kind of want to follow the next few words, okay? I mean, that, that, that's important. I mean, whenever you see on the day of judgment, okay, pay attention because this is important, okay? On the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. That's one of those spooky verses to me. I'm going to be honest. That's where I'm hoping that the verse where it talks about God, you know, being merciful and covering a multitude of sins. I hope that that verse trumps this verse, you know, quite honestly, you know, because I use a lot of words. I'm a preacher. I talk all the time. I get home at night and I'm sick of my own voice. You know, it's like, I don't want to talk. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm tired. But, you know, I, I use a lot of stories. I share a lot of stories and I'm talking, I'm talking. And, you know, my... My way of diffusing tense situations or my way of diffusing things is always to try to cut a joke or to be funny. And, and I realize not all my jokes land or not all my jokes are necessarily appropriate for the audience at hand. And so I've said some really dumb things. And, and, and so when I think about, not, you know, not to mention before I was saved, when I think about the day of judgment and I see this list of everything I've said, and I said, oh, I didn't say that, did I? I was like, oh, I didn't say that. You're counting the stuff I said alone in my car? Are you serious? I mean, you know, and it's like, when you see that list, you're going to be like, oh, my gosh, words matter. What we say matters, you know. I mean, so because our words reveal what's in our hearts. And so we have to be careful when we think of our words. We, I mean, when we think of communication, we think of words, we need to recognize this is serious. And it's like, well, okay, pastor's talking about communication today. Whatever. No, this is serious. This is foundational. Families are not going to get healed until we learn how to do this right, until we learn how to communicate right, until we learn that our words are indicators of a heart. What words you choose do matter. Whether or not you swear, whether or not you gossip, whether or not you slander, whether or not you lie, those things matter. You know, the, the, the fact that, you know, it's like, um, you know, well, you know I'm, a, I'm a real Christian. I'm a cussing Christian. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and and, and I, I'm not talking about, you know, stepping on a, on, on a Lego and, and saying a word. I, you know, but the words you use matter. I mean, if you say, you know what, Pastor, it's not that big a deal. If you swear, it's just, it's, it's, that's just words. Really? If, so if I stood up here and I just began going, man, let me tell you, I had a bleep and bleep, 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 and bleep, you know, I started cussing away, you guys would be like, that's cool. No, you would not. You would go to lunch, gossip about this horrible pastor, this cussing preacher, and then go to some other church and then talk about the cussing preacher. You know, so what words we choose do matter. Swearing, gossip, slander, lies. You know, how we use our words should matter. And I'll also say, and I've said this before, how you speak matters. You can be right and not righteous. 
How you speak matters. And I've learned this from my dog. And I get in trouble whenever I use this illustration from you pet people. Or no, you don't have pets. You have family members. And so, uh, and so and you're like, oh, no, my dog. You know, and so, but, uh, you know, but I use Maxie. Maxie is a perfect illustration of this. I can go, I love you. And she, oh, and she, she goes away, you know. But if I go, you're the dumbest little dog. Yes, you are. You're the stupidest dog on the planet. She's like, oh, you love me. You love me. I mean, she doesn't. She just knows how I'm speaking. She knows exactly how I'm speaking. And, and so, and that's what she's responding to. And so you can speak a truth. But if you do it with a hateful spirit, you've negated the truth. I had someone come to me after the first service that went, well, well, Sean, so you're saying we're not supposed to call out evil or speak against evil? Yes. I, no, you should, absolutely, we should be speaking against, against evil. But if you're doing it with a hateful heart, if you're doing it out of anger, if you're, you know, and the problem is well, the people who, who think that we should speak out of anger and should speak out, they always bring up the whole Jesus turned over the money changers' tables and used the whips and that kind of thing. You get to do that if you're Jesus. You get to do that if your whole ministry has been built upon compassion, forgiveness, and speaking love and truth to people. And then he t- knocks over the, the tables. The problem is most of us, our first reaction is to knock over the tables. Our first reaction is to, oh, I got a whip coming. Jesus did it, so I got one coming. You know? And so that's our, the problem is that's our first reaction. Our first reaction is to be hateful. Our first reaction is to be, is to be angry in Jesus' name. I have never, 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 and I've been doing this a long time. I've never seen anyone come to Jesus because you shouted them there. I've never seen anyone's mind changed because you yelled louder than they did. It's never happened. So stop yelling. See, I just did that in a non-loving voice, and so you didn't receive that as well as you should have. Stop, stop yelling. You're, you're not going to make, you're, you're, all, all you're doing is raising your blood pressure. How you speak matters just as much as what you say. I don't even know what to say to that. Okay. <laughs> um, bless you, I think, you know. Um, and by the way, as we're speaking to this, what we say matters, but in our day and time, typing counts, retweets count, sharing memes count. It's all the same. Well, that wasn't my thing. I just shared the meme. No, you share it, you own it. You retweet it, you own it. So, you know, don't, don't, don't be throwing that out and try to cover under, well, that's what they said. No, 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 no. You share it, you own it, you retweet it, you own it. And if you retweet it, you stand behind it, and you know that it's, here, it's coming from a place of love and compassion. Now, there is evil in this world, and we should speak out against it. And we should absolutely speak out against it. And there are things that I see in this world, and there is evil in this world, and I see it, and it drives me crazy. And I can't tell you how many times I... Delete, 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 delete. You know, because... I can't, the, the, as a Christian, I can't share everything that comes out of my mouth because what I say matters and how I say it matters. And, and so we should speak out. And so if you're angry, you respond, but before you hit send, you ask yourself, is this godly? Is this helpful? Is this going to change their mind? Then hit send. Because words matter, and our words reveal what's in your heart. And quite honestly, if you're speaking truth, but you're speaking truth in anger, it's not about truth, and it's not about Christianity. It's about your pride and you wanting to win the fight. And that's what's happening too much in our country. That's what's happening too much in our world, is we have no desire to see God glorified. We just want to win our fight. Our corner is better than your corner, and our corner is right, and so I'm going to shout so that my, my way will get right. And it's about me. It's not about God. It's not about Christ. It's not even about his agenda. It's about being right. Words matter. And how you speak and what you speak reveals your heart. 
Robert Frost said, half the world is composed of people who have something to say and can't, and the other half have nothing to say and keep on saying it. That's the internet. Number one, our words reveal. Number two, our words have power. In James chapter 3, this is where we'll be spending the bulk of our time, verses 5 through 12, It says, how great a forest is set ablaze with such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison, and with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in his likeness. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things should not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Our words reveal but our words also have power i mean words have an incredible amount of power our words have the power to hurt it says over and over that you know that how great is a forest is set ablaze by fire the tongue is a fire it's an evil it's it setting the on fire the entire course of life it is set on fire by hell you can see that james has had an issue with talking in the past you know i mean something some there's some there's something going on with james here okay it's, i don't know if he was you know he had some stuff that he struggled with or if he got picked a lot picked on a lot as a kid i don't know but james apparently is feeling very strong about the tongue and being able to control the tongue, but he's spot on. Our words have the power to hurt. Our words can destroy. It, it, it says it can be a spreading blaze. If you don't want to believe in James, believe James, Proverbs 16, 27 says a scoundrel plots evil and his speech is like a scorching fire. Our words uh, just consume and it's amazing how, how quickly hurtful words can spread. It's amazing how much, how quickly a hurtful word can destroy a life, can destroy a person's day. You can be having the best day and someone speaks something hurtful to you and it's instantly gone. I tell you, one day, it was one, one Sunday... I was a youth pastor at another church, and I preached a sermon, and I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I walk down, and I'm like, all right, I give all these to God anyway, so I, I, I try not to take you know, credit for the good ones, you know, and I try not to take credit for the bad ones. I'm like, all right, Lord, you, you gave it to me. I preached it. It's up to you. Because some of them, I, honestly, I'm like, that was horrible. And some of you guys will come back and say, oh, thank you. That was amazing. I'm like, really? Uh, all right, God, that was awesome because that was horrible. But... There was one sermon I preached, and I'm like, even when I wrote it, I was feeling like, whoo, this is going to be good. And I preached it, and afterwards I was like, oh, my gosh, any minute now, I'm going to be hearing from conferences, and they're going to say, come speak, because that was the jam. It was awesome. And I just brought it down. I mean, I got like, whoo, I mean, it was like preaching, and I felt so good about it. I had three, see, I had three people right on the little, like our blue cards, we had green sheets at this church, and they wrote on the green sheets, supposed to be prayer requests, but they're usually shooting jabs at us. Um, and three green sheets turned in that day talking about how offensive and how horrible that message was and that we shouldn't let the youth guy preach anymore. And I was like, woo, that's awesome. And that one green sheet, I was like, huh, I'm giving up. I don't want to preach ever again. You know, I mean, it's amazing. How one word can destroy you. And I got into a funk. I'm like, I don't know how to preach. And, you know, I found out who it was, and they're just bitter people. But anyway, um, but words can destroy you. And you've all been there. We've all been there to that place where you're having a great day, and someone 
criticized you or yelled at you or barked at you or did something and it just ruined the rest of your day. Maybe said something that was inappropriate. Words can just quickly destroy you and it's like a fire. It just consumes and what's left over is just char. It can be like a spreading blaze. It can be like a savage beast. And it's almost like when you allow your spirit to get into a dark place and you begin to speak and you, it's almost like you can't stop it. The bitterness just comes flowing and you know even in the back of your mind somewhere in your, the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you this is wrong and you just keep going. It can be like a savage beast that's deadly to others and it's destructive. Our words have the power to hurt. There are things that have been done to me and my my father abused me in several ways. But it's the things he said to me as a child. I'm talking child. That I still remember. I still hear him saying to this day. Words have the power to hurt. Words also have the power to heal. Words can, can, I mean, the, the, the same way, you can be having the worst day ever and someone come up to you and say, hey, so glad that you're here. You're, or, you look great today. How are you doing? You know, well, thank you. That's awesome. You know, or, or you know what? You, you feel like you did something horribly and someone's come and say, you know what? That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that. There are certain words that have incredible power to heal. Thank you. It's an incredible, incredible word. Uh, it, you know, we, we don't do it enough, and we only talk about it in, in November when it comes to Thanksgiving. But thank you is an incredibly power, two powerful words. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. You know, uh, you're special. You have value. Just complimenting people say thank you for what you do you, or you know some people people just need a you look good today you know thank you you know th- you know that's awesome um, words have the power to heal us saying an uplifting thing to a spouse saying an uplifting thing to a child to a teenager to to someone in your family just being willing to say i love you those words mean a lot. It's, it's interesting. There are certain things in mine and Audrey's relationship, you know, we've, sometimes it's like, I love you. We say it, I say it so often. A while back, I decided, you know what? I like you. Because that's different. I'm her husband. I'm supposed to love her, you know. But I like you. That says something different. You know, I'm bound by covenant to love you till death do us part, you know? And some of us are like, <laughs> would death hurry? You know, and I get that. That's not me. I'm just saying, I'm talking about some of y'all. And I didn't want her to feel that. And so I decided a while back that I would tell her, you know what, I like you. Because that means something different. It means I want to spend time with you. I like you. You know, uh, it, uh, it didn't say, you know, to like one another till death do us part. That part comes, hopefully, you know, autom- you know, that's not automatic. You have to still like each other. I like my wife. I love her, but I like her. And so being able to say, I like you, you know, uh, you know, I like your face. You know, just stuff like that. Just say, say stuff to one another that... that you know, that, that shows them that you're thinking about them. Words. See, I, I said those things and y'all started chuckling. The words have the power to heal, can, can lift each other up. And so how do we do that? My favorite way, my favorite way to communicate as a family, and, and that's kind of what we're talking about today is, is family, is to reclaim the table. 
I love the dinner table. And, and I don't want to, I, I, I always push back when people say, we need to get back to the good old days. Would you stop? The good old days were only good for white men, okay? So can we stop with the good old day talk all the time? I mean, so good old days were always good, but some things in the good old days were good. I like, now my family, and you've heard my family stories, most of you, it was a dumpster fire, okay? My family was a hot mess growing up, but one thing that we did, my dad, good or bad, he demanded that we eat dinner together as a family at 6 o'clock. And to this day, I'm like, <laughs> it's 6.30, I'm starving, you know what I mean? So 6 o'clock, I grew up, we had dinner on the table at 6 o'clock, and we ate, no matter what it was, and, and, and I, so I like, you know, I like that. There's some people, some of you, you don't even have a dining room anymore. You're like, well, who uses a dining room? And you turn it into like a second den or whatever. I mean, I mean, some people don't even have dining rooms anymore. And so me, I'm like, let's reclaim the dinner table. We don't do it perfectly. Why? Because we're busy. Because we always have something else to do. We have soccer. We have band practice. We have this. We have that. We have umpteen other things to do. And so we have, to, we have to, 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 to recognize, we have to reclaim the table at least a couple of times, once, twice a week, come together at the table. It doesn't matter. You don't have to cook. You're like, who has time to cook these days? Don't cook. Get Domino's, get McDonald's, slap it on a plate and call it dinner. But come together. Put the phones away. When we did it, we always went around the table. What was your best and worst today? And it forced even the teenagers to talk just to get together to find out what's going on in your life. What, what, you know, who are you? Because if you guys have teenagers, you know what that feels like. It's like, I, I don't even really know you anymore. Every now and again, and, and I, I'm telling you, for those of you who have young families, all these babies gurgling in here and everything, I remember hearing, guys, take advantage of this because it's going to fly by. And her old mind, oh, why don't you stop? Because you know I hate cliche. But it does. The other day, I woke up four in the morning and just my heart broke because I had a dream of my 18-year-old girl and my 15-year-old girl. I had a dream remembering them when they were just little toddlers running around laughing and hopping on the couch. And I saw it as vivid as though it was happening in real time. And my heart just, oh, it just broke. Because my babies aren't babies anymore. And it flies by. And so you can't reclaim those baby times, but have time together. Come together at the family, at the table. And say, and talk. Talk. Put the phones away because this is what's happening in our world. You have, everyone has their own thing, soccer, band, mom's working late, dad's busy uh, on a laptop finishing up a project. Meanwhile, everyone, and I find it interesting in the posture that it presents us, everyone has our own phone and worshiping our own little world. Who's my it even looks like we're worshiping as we're looking down at our phones. We have to reclaim the table. We have to reclaim that opportunity to communicate. How do we do that? James 1, 19 through 22 says this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Let's back that up and say that again. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly, that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So two things real quick. How do we communicate better as a family? How do you communicate better as a spouse? How do you communicate better as a person? Number one, you have to get rid of evil. Your first communication, the first person that you talk to, the, fir the first thing you've got to fix when it comes to communication is your communication with Jesus. 
We've got to be a people of prayer. You've got to be a person who comes to Jesus first, not when everything's falling apart. I say this all the time. Too many of us come to Jesus at the end of our rope when he's been there for the whole length of the rope. He should be our first line of defense, not our last line of defense. We should be a people of prayer. Fix that conversation first. Fix that time where you come to Jesus on the daily and you communicate with him first and you get rid of all the moral filth, all the bitterness, all the anger, all the angst, all the anxiety, and you give it to Jesus. You lay it at the foot of the cross and you walk away and then you're able to improve your communication with others. So first you get rid of evil and then you obey God's word. Whenever I do counseling with parents and I ask how their communication is going with their children. Whenever I do counseling with um, couples and I ask how is your communication with one another, I always get excuses. And the top top three excuses are they're afraid of rejection. Because even even your teenagers can be mean to you, you know, because teenagers are evil little people. But so we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of putting ourselves out there and getting it thrown back up in our face. We're afraid of conflict. I I can't tell you. I mean, I've talked to to spouses and I've talked to men. It's like, you know what? Every time I bring something up, every time I speak, it turns into a fight. And Sean, I'm just tired. I'm exhausted. I don't want to fight anymore. And so they just stop talking. And that's the beginning of the end. And then finally... More often than not, it's because they're afraid of being a hypocrite. I don't want to. I know I need to be a better spiritual leader for my children, but they know who I am. You guys have heard the story of Sean Thomas when I was a little kid. I mean, when he was a little, you know, just a little ankle biter, he used to say, you know, Daddy, when you get mad, you turn into the Hulk and everything. And so, because I'd lose my temper, and I'm the Hulk. And I have, and I've I've lost my temper. But the thing is, they've seen me. They've seen me do things. They've seen me in ways that, you know, you're like, you shouldn't see a pastor be. And they hear me talk about how we're supposed to be. And they hear me preach from the pulpit. And they hear what, what I say we're supposed to do according to God's word. But they've seen me blow it. And so what I have to do is I have to go to them and say, listen, God, sit down. I'm sorry. Daddy blew it today. I need you to forgive me. That's open communication. Have, don't get rid of your pride to where you're even able to ask your child to forgive you. You're willing to go to your child and say, Daddy blew it today. I'm sorry. Uh, We're sorry. I'm going to turn Canadian all of a sudden. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I I know I blew it, but I need you to pray. I I need you to, to pray for Daddy. I need you to forgive me. And they see that openness. And they see the gospel working in your life. So don't be afraid of being a hypocrite because guess what? You are. You are a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites. We're all sorry sapsuckers in need of grace. All of us. Marty wrote a song several years ago and um, I asked him to sing it today. He wrote it for another family series that I did And there was a line that wrecked me. It says, no more cowards. Now it's time we talk or we're going to implode. No pretending, simply speaking love to heal our homes. That line wrecked me. I was like, wow. Because why don't we communicate more with our spouses? Because we're afraid. Why don't we communicate more with our children? Because we're afraid. Why don't we talk more? Because we're afraid. It's time to be bold. If we're going to heal our families, it's time to be bold. No more cowards. It's too important. This is too important for your pride. This is too important for you to be stuck. This is too important. So put away your pride, put away your fear, and talk. 
communicate. Don't judge one another. Don't, don't criticize one another. Love one another. Talk to one another. Encourage one another. Heal through your words. As you guys have heard me say, I, I love the family image of the table. And 2,000 some odd years ago, Jesus had to find a way to communicate to his disciples a symbol that would remind them what he was going to do for them on the cross, to remind them of his love. And I absolutely love that he chose the table. He chose a dinner table because there's something about, hey, let's grab a meal. You know, that's why I love Audrey and I. We love, if you're a new person, we love taking people out for dinner because there's, we, 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 that's, we talk. You know, that's why I love the, you know, going for coffee, you know. There's just something about, when you're around a table, you're across from each other, you're, you talk with one another. It's intimate, it's, it's casual, but it's, it's there. And Jesus chose a table, a dinner table, to communicate his love for us. They sat around the table, and he passed around the bread, and he said, this is my body broken for you. And they passed around the, the, the wine. He said, this, this represents my blood shed for your sins. And whenever you eat this, remember me. Remember what I have done for you. Remember the price that was paid for your access to God, for your salvation. Remember. And so today, what I want us to do is I, I want us to, to, to come together. I want us to pray, and I want you to evaluate your heart. Is there anything in there? Because your heart, the words are an indicator of your heart. And so if you have been speaking with bitterness and anger and judgment, Maybe there's bitterness, anger, and judgment in your heart. So maybe there's something you need to get out. You need to repent. Say, Lord, forgive me of this, this, and this. These blockages in your heart. And repent. And then with a clean heart, come to the table. We have two tables with the elements, the bread and the juice. Come to the table, take it back to your seat. You can take it together as a family or individually and just respond. And as you take the elements, you say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because of your table, my table can have joy. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. And God, I pray right now that you would examine our hearts. Make us whole. We come to the table and ask for a spirit of joy. Heal our families, dear Jesus. Make our tables joyful again. In Jesus' name. Our thoughts just bounce around our heads. We need to speak, but swear we can't. Are there no words to say? Why do we hide away? We hope to step around the holes, but we refuse to let things go. We hold our tongues and wait. It blows up in our face. So no more hiding all that we feel. No denying what demands our full attention. No more lying. We're 
with our lips sealed. I need you here. I need to hear. You need to let you in. No more cowards. Now it's time we talk. Or will implode? No pretending. Simply. Speaking love to heal our homes, to heal our homes. Oh, Lord, we just pray right now that you would heal our homes. Heal the divide that is so prevalent. Heal the marriages, God. Heal the, the children. Bring us together. It's so important. Thank you for your power. We thank you for your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we're uh, dismissed, I just want a couple, couple, three things. Uh, number one, uh, Andre would love you to sign up to help for the uh, yard give back there at the information table. If this is your first time with us, we'd like to say thank you so much. I uh, hope you filled out that blue card. Take it to that info table, and uh, Dave back there has a, a gift for you, uh, swap you out the card for the gift, and uh, just thank you so much for being here with us, and finally, October 24th is uh, the Sunday before Halloween, and it is our third annual Hoot Nanny, and we are so very excited about this, it's going to be a great night, great tons of fun, uh, we're just asking you to do three things, we'll have sign-ups next week. Um, and we will have, uh, we need you to, uh, you know, bring candy, you know, candy, candy, candy. We need candy, tons of candy. Um, and uh, also, uh, we'll have sign-ups for you to help out, but also promote, promote, promote. Uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, we have events for the Yard Give. We have events set up for the Hoot Nanny. Share that, spread that out, um, and uh, let's get the word out. Um, guys, lots going on. Please follow us on uh, social media. Follow us on, uh, uh, sign up for our newsletter and our website. So lots going on. So I want you to know, make sure that you can do that. All right. Love you guys. Go and send them more. Have a great week.